So today we're going to go ahead and dig into our memory object here. Um, so again, I encourage you to go with a, you know, a modular setup um, and just keep things simpler for you. Um, and I, like I had mentioned in the previous video, you will have to change what it's importing. Um, based on how you do some of this, you may not need the defines. Um, this would be the first file that mine normally needs the defines. Um, to keep things simplistic during the tutorial, I've included this, but, um, but this memory types table uh, actually normally exists in my defines. Um, so it wouldn't even be in here unless I just want to, you know, comment it out and leave it in here just to, as a reference, uh, kind of like I have here. Um, but normally outside of the tutorials, this stuff I, I don't actually have in here. Um, but, and how you do that, that's up to you. But again, I would encourage you to use, you know, that modular fashion and then have your defined and have this table in there just so you can use it in other places and that kind of thing. Um, but even it's not a hundred percent necessary because it, it does just use the underlying value types that she gives us. So you can use either notation, you know, it just depends upon how you want to do it um, and even I kind of you know um, the default is set through this memory types table but it, a lot of times I just use you know VTD word or VT single and that kind of thing but if you feel like you might prefer to use it in this kind of notation you, you know you're more than welcome to do that um, and again you know just make sure you do change how where it's requiring the you know the um, symbol object and whatever you set up as your helpers file and that kind of thing so you know that way this will actually run and work otherwise it will not if you don't you know if you leave this the same and don't name your module the exact same name which i still wouldn't do again i would actually edit that and change that so that way your module is you know doesn't conflict with mine um and you can use it however you see fit um so we're going to start digging into this uh memory object here and you'll see we've got a couple local tables here. Like I said, this is kind of more separated. Um, so we've got a couple memory ta or tables here that just set up some things so we can do a more interesting thing on down here. And what it allows us to do is just use that, you know, the, you know, this read, and it will be based on the value type or the type technically. Um, or at least that's what the uh, property or uh, variable that it uses is actually named. It's just type. Um, and then, you know, we can use a write in a very similar fashion. At that point, like you can see here, you know, to get the parameter info, we would actually have to know how the corresponding um, value types functions work. So in the case of D word here, you know, we would have to come up here to actually see that it takes a sign and that kind of thing. Um, but it, to me, once you get kind of, if you, if you know how the um, normal read and write functions work, it really won't be a major change for you. Because um, I do keep them in the, you know, kind of the same order and do that kind of thing. Um, for, you know, instance of string, just because it does have a couple extra things. Um, I do kind of keep it that way. Just to keep things simplified so I don't have to remember that, you know, I've changed the order and all that. Um... And, but then, of course, we do add extra stuff. Um, Cheat Engine doesn't have a function to explicitly read and write to a wide string, but because there is a wide string type, I, I've gone ahead and chose to do that, even though I, I think that's technically mostly for the um, um, auto guess and that kind of thing for the uh, dissect data structures. But I chose to, you know, actually include this in the thing so that way you can use that directly um, just by setting the type but then i've also got um a property here that uh will allow it you know it, so you can just use the normal string functions and then it will just normally know whether or not it's a wide character string um it, you know and that's kind of the idea is you can always set these up to be however you want um because even if you notice with me on that D word or I think the float would be a better example. Um, I prefer the wording of single and double because t 
to me, you know, calling this refloat for a re, you know, to read a um, single precision floating point doesn't make sense because, you know, redouble is still a float. Um, you know, we're, we're just reading a double precision floating point. Um, so that's one thing I've always, you know, I mean, I've used it and it's fine. It's never really messed me up or anything. I just know that, you know, float is a single precision and double is a double precision. Um, but that's part of the idea here is um, not only in my functions file do I have some uh, aliases name, but here we can also, you know, so I can name an alias and make it to where you can still use right float or read float if you prefer it that way. But for me, I can use the write single or, you know, read single instead. Um, and it'll read a single precision floating point and do, you know, as you can see here, literally just read, you know, use write float or read float. Um, so, anyway, I'm, I'm kind of rambling on again. Um, so, you know, we can do a lot of different things and set it up, make things work the way we want. And that's, you know, to me, that's kind of the whole point of writing some of these modules. Um, so digging into our memory object here, if we want to see what's actually going on with that read and write function and, and understand what these tables are for, um, you know, you kind of can get the, you know, start to get an idea if you do understand how Lua works. So like when we create a table, um, normally if we just did it like a list of items like this is, well, now it's not really a list. Um, if we just, you know, had a table that was uh, set up to where it just, you know, had some strings in it. It would actually be, you know, they would be indexed with a number instead of, you know, a direct name. Um, and so what Cheat Engine does, uh, let's say string two, um, you know, so what, not Cheat Engine, what Lua does is it allows you to also explicitly say what these indexes are because normally this would be an index of one this would be two three and on down the list um, but we can explicitly say what index we want by using these you know the square brackets here and we could actually make it start at an index of 10. i do believe at that point this would actually still be two i'm not 100 percent sure on that because i've never mixed and matched in that way other than you know towards the bottom is how i would normally do that um, if I wanted to skip some spots or something. Um, but again, we can go through and actually explicitly set all those. Um, and if you're unaware, Cheat Engine or uh, Lua actually does allow you to use strings so that way you can get some, you know, some complicated things going. We could concatenate and use a variable, you know, and that way it would actually make whatever value holds concatenated to this word sum and it would that would actually be how you would have to access it um, and then of course we could say you know if um, value if value was you know just set to um, value uh, we can still access that by just going if uh, let me be more clear here we could actually just access that by doing table dot some value. Um, we wouldn't have to always do it with the brackets, but again, we can get more complicated behavior by actually still doing a similar thing down here when we want to access it. And that would allow us to set it or get the value or, you know, whatever we need to do with it. Um, so that is one thing to keep in mind with Lua, and we're going to kind of use that behavior in this. Um, so what we're doing here is we're going to just set up some tables that are needed for those read and write functions. That's why they're even local. You're not really, you know, these aren't meant to be used outside of this. Um, so first we've just got our using an index of the actual value type that is uh, Cheat Engine uses. And that will make things easier to look up here in a minute. Um, and then we just have a word that we need. Um, and really, if you look at those functions when we read and write, that's what that's about. This is just so we can tag this word on to, you know, after the word read or after the word byte and that way, or after the word read and after the word write. 
so that way we can do you know read bytes and you know read byte read word d word and you know on down the line um, and just simplify that process and then here we're actually yeah setting our um, sizes I'm not actually sure I'm using that now that I think about it yeah okay I am yeah that's so I can get a default size that's all that's for okay I'm sorry I forgot why I even had that um, so that you know that's all we're really doing with that it's just setting it up so I can get some default sizes. Yeah. Um, so this is really the main one. We This is the only one we need um, for the uh, value types. Um, or to get that simplified read and write functions working. So in the end, what we're doing down here is we're just using that memory types name and then we're going to use the instances type to actually look up what name it is um, because again those are you know we're just we've got this indexed with the um, actual value types of value and then this will return you know a name you know d word for a d word and you know single for a single and, and on down the list um, and then here like we kind of like we kind of talked about just a minute ago we're just creating the function name that we need to use um, and then here just in case something does go awry we actually do make sure it is a function um, because in Lua you know one of the things that gives it some interesting behavior is you don't actually have to have a function declared um, to start typing it is as if you're using it so you can actually make it so you know you have a function that you might set at certain points and thus you'll need to check to see if it is in fact a function and not nil um, but then you know essentially you know you know call it only when it exists um, whereas most other languages you you know you have to it's a very very explicit and static when it comes to that kind of thing if the function isn't declared you absolutely you know the compiler will complain when you try and compile things um, Whereas Lua doesn't really care. It will just look up whatever name we've told it. And if it exists, it calls it. If it doesn't, you know, in the case of a function, it'll throw an error and tell you you're trying to call a nil value. Um, but that allows us to do these kind of more interesting things under the hood. So that way here, in the end, all we're going to be doing is calling read whatever value type, you know, so read D word by default on our instance um, and then again that's where we can get that you know because of the way this one works you can't really use the uh, colon notation <coughs> at least I don't think so I wonder if you could um, never tried it honestly um, anyway so we do have to make sure we explicitly pass the instance of self to this function but then after that we're just using that you know the three dot notation to pass all parameters to it so this way it will use whatever param you know whatever that function uses that's what gets used here um, and that's really honestly kind of the main thing with this you know the read function and the write function is basically the same way about the only difference is it actually does return um, instead of the value it returns the status uh, like all the other read and write function or all the other write functions used in cheat engine and if you're unaware, that just makes it so um, if you use, say, you know, write float, you can actually do, you know, local status equals write float and whatever address you're wanting to write to with the value. Um, and it will give you a Boolean value telling you whether that write was successful. Um, and, you know, meaning if it was successful, you get true. If it's not, you get false. Um, and in my case, I kind of continue that. And it will be nil if there was some kind of error. Uh, really, the idea is I'm throwing an error, so it's going to halt execution anyway. So that doesn't really matter. But, but the idea is it would, you know, it would return nil if you were using this in p call, um, or it would return true or false based on whether the write was successful, uh, or true or false based on whether the write was successful. Um, and this will just always, of course, return the value. Whatever that function returns, it's just going to return that. You know, ultimately. Um, 
So that's kind of the more complicated one. I do want to touch on these two. I don't have them set up yet. Um, I have thought about it, and I want to set up a video where we actually go through and set these up. Um, and I, th I think that'll be a good video in this tutorial process. I think it'll be more after we dig into the objects. We might come back to this one. Um, and that way, because I, you know, I mean, I do have a basic idea of what I need to do just based on some of the functions that I know exist in Cheat Engine. Kind of put some of that stuff down here. Um, but I, I think actually seeing how I go about thinking about how I'm going to do this on setting it up and testing it and all that it'll end up being a longer video I think and that's kind of why I don't want to do it right this minute um, but I think that will be helpful to see you know my thought process and you know even the steps I go through and where I'm looking stuff up and and how I come up with doing something like this to read a custom value type um, I just think that will be helpful to see that full process um, and not just me explaining code I've already written. Um, well, I'm sure that you know can kind of help because we start learning about some of these functions and how to do things. Um, I, I think actually seeing how I go about doing it when I've never done it before will be helpful. Um, but I also encourage you to you know maybe look some of this stuff over and you know just know this is directly out of the um, Cheat Engine Lua text file, um, the, you know the documentation so to speak. Um, and try and figure out how to write, you know, how to read and write custom, you know, types. Um, the only catch I do, again, I haven't tried it yet, so I'm not completely sure, but I am thinking under the, you know, the um, main thing with those functions would be it does have to be a type registered with Lua and not just um, an auto assembler script because Cheat Engine does allow you to create types just using an auto assembler script. I don't know if if get custom type will actually work for those. We'd have to actually test that later and see if, if that works too when we get this all set up. And it might it might actually work. Cheat Engine may be set up to where it'll get any custom type. Um, it doesn't matter whether it was done in Cheat Engine or Assembly. I'm kind of hoping that's the way it is, but if it's not then it will always have to be something that's been registered with Lua. Anyway, so um, that's kind of one thing I, you know to keep in mind. Um, so we won't really won't go over these because all we're doing is just I am checking so for some reason just because. Uh, but anyway, the, the main thing this does is just throw an error. I think it's just so I can get the name. Um, you know, to let me know that I haven't set these up yet is all. Uh, in case I, you know, I I don't think I'd really forget that, but that way I, you know. I'll know right away that I need to finish this uh, without wondering why it's not returning a value or not doing what I think it should be doing. Um, but we'll go over that in a later video and, you know, and like I said, actually set these up so we can see, you know, you can see how I would go about doing that. Um, and again, if you think you can figure it out or, you know, I still even just encourage you, you know, even if you don't think you can figure it out, just give it a shot. You know, you, you might be surprised what you can come up with. Um, you know, reading the documentation and that kind of thing is, is a big part of learning any language. Um, so you absolutely do need to know how to do that. And no, not all documentation is the same. Um, there is some that is very well put out there. I know um, much shit as I like to give Microsoft. Uh, their documentation on their stuff is actually really nice because I mean it, it gives you parameters it tells you all this stuff kind of similar to what I'm doing up here um, you know it gives you a lot of information about what actually how it works and how you can use it and you know what each thing is and all of that um, and some documentation even gives you examples like actual type this into the um, into a file and execute it and then you'll get this and that kind of thing I don't I obviously don't go that far here but um, and Lua, uh, I don't know, maybe there's another spot, but the Lua.org documentation to me is just god-awful. Um, I mean, it is helpful. It's definitely better than nothing, but, you know, like, it, it just, it won't tell me what the actual parameters are, and that to me is just so weird. Um, you have to, like, go three different areas to figure out what parameters are and all that. Um, luckily, Cheat Engine's documentation is, is much nicer. 
um, it actually you know does tell us what the parameters it takes and you know which ones are optional and, and what each one actually is as far as what kind of objects they might be for some of the more complicated stuff you know and that kind of thing um, and even here just that you know good naming conventions you know I can usually read this and and know what I need to pass to it um, I don't have to even read it you know further down the line to figure out what each one of these needs to be I can just kind of know that's a name you know that's going to be my type name I just need to tell how many bytes it is and then some functions here to convert and then tell it whether or not it is a float and you know since it is is float you know I know that's going to be a boolean um, and kind of you know so uh, yeah, that, you know another example of why good documentation is, is really nice um, and yes Lua just drives me kind of bonkers with their documentation I don't know who came up with the idea of doing it that way um, other than I guess maybe it's so people that don't know how to program can understand it a little better than documentation that's made more for programmers but as a you know if you're understand programming at least a little bit like I do um, reading that documentation is just the most asinine thing because you know like we discussed on that concatenate function if you look that up on lua.org it literally just tells you it works like the add function and it's like okay you go look at the add function and it just tells you it adds two values together and I'm just kind of like what the fuck okay you know? <laughs> like I mean you can kind of figure it out eventually okay it takes two parameters and I need to add those together but at the same time it'd be nice if it just told me that it, you know takes a left and a right value and then you need to return the you know those two values you know added together for that function um, or to make it work right but you know again Lua is set up to extend it so maybe that's kind of the free reign there is it just tells you you know under you know what's gonna basically needs to happen but you can make it do whatever you want um, anyway I went on a tangent probably edit this out maybe not um, anyway so let's dig more into this and actually get into the you know the memory function here um, so we've got our two string concatenate um, unfortunately we do have to declare these anywhere where we want to use them it can't inherit this uh, for whatever reason uh, again much like the call it does actually have to exist in the meta table um, and we have to do it differently I, I think I kind of explained it wrong the in one video or I may have deleted that one but um, no I think I did uh, I think that's the object oriented one but anyway um, so to make the actual memory object callable, you know, we have to have in its meta table that call function. But to actually be able to use, like if you actually tried to call an instance to create a new instance, um, that won't work because it doesn't, you know, call doesn't exist in the meta table. We could declare it down here again, but, you know, I, I don't like doing it that way because, you know, I'm not going to make an instance off an instance. I'm going to use the class. Um, but to get the instance to do to string or concatenate um, we have to have it in the meta table and because this class becomes the meta table of the instance um, that's how that kind of works um, so but we do have to declare it each time um, th there are workarounds for that but they just get a little goofy so I just end up doing this since I don't really add a lot of a lot of the meta methods um, and to me, this is more explicit. Uh, I, you know, if anything, at most, I would maybe declare a, a, you know, a function that I use in all of these that these would call. But this way, I can just look directly at this and know that okay, you know, two string is set for the memory object, and so is concatenate, and then know that I don't have add or any of that, um, and just make it more readable and quicker to access that information. So we get into our new, and basically this works a lot like our um, uh, symbol new function. Um, the only difference, I think, is the size where I do, you know, here I'm actually, I'm using that memory type size so that way if you don't set the size um, but you only set the type it will tell me what size it needs to be um, and really that's not super important you kind of 
it, it's mostly like um, for the bite array um, string wide string maybe a custom type down the road if, you know I'm not really sure I'm thinking those will already be kind of explicit and it won't matter but anyway um, you know so it's not for everything that it's really required again I just go ahead and set it up so you know the idea there is it's it, you know I could use that in another function later instead of maybe looking at the type if I just want to read bytes and you know you know do like we did with that timer um, and just read and write bytes to copy a value from one to the other I could you know in theory use this to know how many bytes there are well not so much of that because it's not accessible but use the size to determine how many bytes that value type takes up without having to look it up again um, and that's you know that's honestly kind of the only difference um, the main thing here you know much like in our other function we need to check the name and sanitize it before we inherit but here I go ahead and do it after we inherit um, because it, it really doesn't matter um, and then that way if you don't set the type it will have that default type and here's where we actually start getting to more of the actual stuff we're adding to the memory object um, so I allow a way to reset the memory so to speak um, and this is one that does use a size to know how many bytes to write so that way for a D word it's going to know to write four bytes um, and you can tell it what character you want to use or more what number you want to use um, or it'll just default to zero and just reset it with zeros so that way, you know, if, we're, if it's a byte array that, you know, we're doing something with or a string or whatever, we could reset the whole thing and just clear it all out very easily. Um, and to do that, you know, we, we're, of course, checking self. Then we're going to set byte to either what you've passed or to zero. Um, we create a byte table to start doing this because, I mean, we could iterate through each byte and do a write for each individual one but I've always preferred to you know um, I've never timed it but I would imagine this is faster because I'm thinking each one of these writes is going to take a little longer than it does just to stick a byte in a table um, so we create our table and then we're just going to go through our for loop here start at one and then go to whatever this size is you know so D word would be you know one to four and then we're just going to use that index and explicitly set our index um, so it'll just be you know byte one is this byte two is that you know and on down the line um, and then here once again we're going to need to use target self to know uh, I guess you know, eh, kind of talked about it in one video but anyway um, we're going to use target self so we can know whether we need to use the uh, local function or the regular one um, I was doing some debug in there um, and then all, that's all we do is we just use that and then we use the uh, get address to get our address and then we just write that byte table so that way we can clear out the memory reset it um, that kind of thing not one that's majorly needed but I just kind of like the idea of being able to do that very quickly um, and not have to you know do with this loop and do all this stuff and um, so like in a, you know the byte array if you were using that to actually you know you're using an AOB scan you find a place that you know you want to edit and then you've already got maybe a byte table because you're just using some no ops um, or a or array of bytes memory type and you brought you know you're just going to replace it with some no ops and stuff like that um, you could actually use one of these objects um, you know add your own parameter your own property that is you know original bytes and store that there and then write some no ops and then go back and you know not only reset it to zeros if you want to mess with it in a different way but then you know you could even you know write back those original bytes and just do more interesting things and of course you could actually set it up to where you write your own functions to do that within the object and have quick access to that without having to do any of that um, directly in your table um, anyway moving on so uh, then here we just start getting into kind of the same functions um, cheat engine has but we just do it to where we can use our defaults you know the stuff we've set up in our object and then even use like that target self kind of thing so we know which 
which function to call, be it the local one or the regular one. Um, and that's kind of all that's going on. If you're familiar with these, with those, uh, the cheat engine ones, you know, most of these aren't going to be really anything you need to learn. Um, about the only, you know, complicated thing is some of these that take multiple parameters. Um, they just allow either or for the, you know, not really technically the first one, but the, the first one for the instance, so to speak, um, that you would normally need to deal with. Um, and that's about it. So here we can actually see for read bytes, all we're doing is we're checking length or return as table for boolean. If it's a boolean, then it needs it's that return as table, and we're going to use size as our length. Um, if it's not a boolean, then I'm just going to do kind of the normal use that. If that's not set, then we're going to use size for length. Um, and then here, the idea is you might actually be using both, uh, you know, length and return as table. And then, so I just need to explicitly check it for a boolean, because otherwise, you know, um, we would always overwrite it if we just did, you know, if return, you know, or if not return as table or something like that. Um, so bullions, you do generally have to do something like that, so that way you can know whether it's actually set to false or, you know, if equal to false or, you know, explicitly check for, for something in that nature. Um, and then again, you know, I already kind of explained it, but again, just the target itself to determine whether we need to use local or the regular. Um, and then from there, it's just, you know, use the get address, and then we pass our parameters we've kind of configured in this. Um, write bytes is, is another one that does take different style parameters, um, and that's basically, this is how Cheat Engine normally does it. It allows you to either pass a table to it, um, or, you know, each individual argument is a byte that you're going to write. Um, and that's just kind of whichever one you prefer. I know I tend to use more of the using, you know, writing a table, but um, there are some times where this is handy, so I have made sure to include that. And of course, this, you know, you could go on 100 bytes, whatever, it doesn't matter because, as we should know, pretty sure I've covered that in a video that actually got posted. Um, the three dots here just indicates, tells Lua to pass all the uh, parameters, whatever they happen to be that was passed to this function. Um, so we can pass all of those parameters to the actual cheat engine functions here. Um, I'm going to try not to keep repeating stuff so, you know, we already know what we're doing with this check and all that. Um, and then read byte is one that I just kind of like to add. Um, just, I don't know, it's just my brain is weirded out by the idea of calling read bytes for a byte. Um, not really a big deal and all we do there is we just actually call our read bytes function and just tell it one and then also explicitly tell it not to return as table because returning a single byte in a table doesn't make sense to me. Um, but of course you could use the read bytes and get a table that way if you prefer even for a single byte. Um, and then write bytes are basically doing the exact same thing here. Um, here just to make the uh, declaration more explicit it's, you know, it's actually set to byte, but we could actually just use the three dots. But, um, but the idea, you know, you're, you're writing a byte, so you don't need to write any more than one. Um, and then here we've got our um, read byte array, and it's doing kind of the same thing. It's just going to use that read bytes function, and in here it just, I do, um, we go ahead and pass a return as table. Um, this one doesn't allow a length because um, I really want it to fall back on the uh, actual size. To me, you should be setting size for byte array. Um, and it would, you know, the idea that it would work much like the, uh, if you add a uh, array of bytes uh, value type as a memory record, it works much in that same kind of way. And I hit no. Oh, there it is. I don't know why that took out. I'm thinking one of my discs had to spin up. Anyway, um, so we were actually set that, you know, there it actually allows us to set a length. Um, I'm calling it size, but at any rate, that's, to me, you should be setting that if you're actually using the um, bytes array, value type or byte array. Um, 
and then we get down to right bite array and it's you know again same kind of thing we're just going to pass it whatever so that way it will work exactly like the right bytes does you you know you can either pass it a table or each byte as a separate argument um, or parameter and then you know this will just return whatever that right bytes returns which would be the status of the operation um, and then we get down here to read word um, and then here we've got a new parameter and that is we do have a property set for that um, to tell it whether we need to read as a sign value or not because um, you know at, while it's stored in memory in much the same way it can be a completely different format when we read it based you know when we read the bytes stored there um, it could be a completely different format based on whether or not we need it to be signed or not um, if you're not real familiar with that uh, you know you're just gonna have to look up signed integer and unsigned integer and kind of read through some of that stuff um, Lua doesn't really have that everything is just a number if it's a number and you know it'll just either be a negative number or a positive number and it can be you know kind of almost any size I'm sure there is a limit but you know really you can you know that's one of the interesting things with Lua that does make it a lot different than most programming languages we don't have to explicitly say it's a you know a word or small integer or a d word or integer or you know a q word or um, large integer i think long integer is normally how it's worded um to tell it how many bits are in that uh it, you know lua just kind of handles all that for us um, but because we're dealing with it in raw memory we need to go back to actually determining whether it's signed and you know and what size it is and all that kind of stuff um, so anyway here we're just you know it's a boolean so I just explicitly check to see if it's a boolean type meaning so it's not set to nil um, if it is a boolean type then I don't want to use the default if it's not then we go ahead and use our default here we just use the instances signed uh, property so to speak um, and then call the corresponding cheat engine function depending upon whether we need to target self or not um, and then here I'm just naming an alias to kind of match up with the uh, cheat engine function names um, and then write bytes is you know kind of a similar thing as before we're just using the target self to tell it you know how we're writing it and of course here we don't have to tell it whether it's signed because the you know it, the number will either be signed or not and cheat engine will just know to do that correctly um, and then naming our uh, or creating an alias for that function um, and then here we just get into dword and it's doing you know basically the exact same thing it's just using you know read integer instead of read small integer um, same thing with write you know again it's you know then we just kind of keep going down this list doing the same thing and, and of course there are in many ways this whole class could have been set up to um, get that less complicated uh, read and write based on the type um, but I just chose to write it in this way so that way if I ever wanted to I could be way more explicit and actually always say you know read but you know read D word or or write keyword or whatever the case calls for and then even if you do have type set differently um, you could you know if there was a scenario where you wanted to write a keyword when the type is set to D word you can do that this will allow you to do that I can't honestly think of a time I would need to do that but you know uh, technically you could if you wanted to or needed to for some reason um, and then we get down here into read single um, you know basically just writing a single precision floating point and you know much like our our read uh, D word and Q word and that kind of thing um, we've got our alias here so that way it matches up with the normal cheat engine functions um, and then same thing you know kind of similar thing here with write single it's just you know using the the target self to see which one we need to write to and passing the value and then we've got our alias here um, 
Now to redouble, the same thing as before, you know, just more doing it with the uh, double precision floating point. Um, and then right double is, you know, again, same thing, and we just kind of go on down this list. Um, if you're not familiar with read pointer, that basically will, under the hood in cheat engine, it will do the same thing as read integer or read keyword based on the um, attached processes. Uh, Oh, I'm not really sure I, mean, I should call that the best wording for it, um, the bit size. Um, you know, so if the attached process is a 32-bit program, this would use um, read integer. And if the attached process is a 64-bit program, we would use read, uh, read keyword. Um, so that way we have the correct size for the addresses is the idea. And that way you don't have to manually check that every single time. Um, and then that's all read pointer really does. And then again, you know, same thing as before. We can use the local or the regular. Um, write pointer is, you know, basically the same way that we don't have to check and then know whether to write to keyword or D word. Um, and it's based on the attached processes, uh, bit size. And then we get down here into read string. Again, much the same. Um, here we've got a max length that can default to uh, the size. And then we've got our um, wide character for, you know, um, argument. And then if it's not set to a, a Boolean, then we go ahead and use the um, instances uh, wide character. And then, you know, again, just determining which one, you know, which function we actually need to call, whether it's local or not, or, you know, how target self is set, and then write string again is much the same way. Um, now, I do do one thing here differently with um, targets, or uh, with write string. I uh, have this parameter that says, you know, no zero terminate. Um, and to me, normally, I always want the string to be zero or uh, null terminated is the way it's worded. Um, and that's a, an underlying thing in, in computers in general. Um, what it does is, so when we write a string or set a, have a string in memory, um, even when we read it, we don't see that, but what Cheat Engine will do is it will go until it reaches a zero. You know, because each character is a byte, and zero is actually a you know, no byte um, or a null character. Um, and so read engine will read a string. It'll just sit there and read bytes until it hits a zero and then that's where it'll stop. And that's basically, you know, uh, any programming language does it that way. I want to say that's, you know, an underlying thing in C even. <coughs> if you wanted to read more than that, you would actually have to explicitly read it as bytes and do something with it. But, you know, no editors really gonna display it um most editors won't display that i, I actually do know uh sublime text will display null characters um if they're in there for some reason uh, you know even in a text file i can actually cut and paste something out that has a null character in it and it will just replace it with the word null i think it does it in like a weird block way but anyway um not really important but but what that does is so you know like the max length is more just so that way in case you don't ever hit a null character you know or you could use that to read a substring you know a section of a string tell it whatever address you know the string starts at plus where you want to start and then how far you want to read into it um i guess i didn't explain this but so max length is a zero based index if we wanted to read the first character only we would have to actually give it a max length of zero and then it will return one character. Um, but I, I like it to be a one based index so that's why I go ahead and do the minus here so that way it goes back to a zero based index. Um, and I actually want to say I didn't even realize that just because I didn't really use read string a lot. Um, and I, it was in my unit testing that I figured out that was how it worked. 
Um, and again, that was, you know, I had built my unit test and then wrote this function to work the way I wanted it to based on that unit test. And, you know, when I found out that it didn't work because of that zero base index, that's when I, you know, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do a minus one here. And that way it'll work the way I want it to. And then I don't have to worry about that anymore. I don't have to remember that's a zero base index. Because to me, it makes more sense for if I want the first character and only the first character that I make that one and not zero. Zero almost sounds like it should just always return an empty string, which, you know, doesn't make sense. And I guess that's why it's set up the way it is. Um, and probably even more, it, it's an underlying way of uh, how Pascal works or something, I'm betting. Uh, no idea, though, really. So we get down to this function, and now we've got this extra parameter because I always wanted to write in a zero based um, or a null character at the end of the string. Whereas normally when you do write string, it does not do that. Um, and I, I've seen a number of different ways to, to get around that. Um, some people would actually write the full length of the string as all zeros. You know, they would read the old string, determine its length write zeros through all that and then write a new string which absolutely works um, but to me it just makes more sense to do it in a normal way and that is I don't care what comes after that zero you know part of that old string can still be there uh, but we just need to write some uh, you know at least a single zero um, for a wide character we would need to write two zeros to tell it it's a full no ca null character and so that's why we're actually writing two zeros here, just so I, I don't have to worry about that. I, you know, I don't need to do another check here to determine whether I need to do one or two. I just go ahead and write two because, it, it, you know, to me it doesn't really matter. Um, that's less important. And so here we're just determining our length. Um, this one does get a little more, not, not really complicated, but we're just doing a little more to do that. Um, basically, once we determine whether it's a wide character, then we're going to use this. Um, if you've never seen something getting set in this way, uh, it's basically an if statement um, in just one line telling it how to set this. So like if this was true, then it will set it using the length of, uh, I guess maybe we haven't discussed this. Um, this is a way to get the length of a table, a string, those are actually the only two things I know that you use this on, but there may be other instances. But basically, it's a shorthand because there actually is a length function. Um, and I guess my highlighter ain't showing it. At least I'm pretty sure that is actually. A, <laughs> I always use the shorthand. So um, anyway, that you know that'll just give us the length of whatever the string we're trying to write is. Um, and then we're just going to take that length and multiply it by two so we can know the full length of the string if it is supposed to be a wide character. Um, and then that way we can get down here and actually write in the right spot because we're just going to tell it to write at whatever the uh, instance's address is plus the length of the string. And then we're just going to write our zeros there. Um, but basically to make this look a little different, if we wanted to write this as an if statement, what we could do is just say if wide character, then length, um, and we would need to declare it up here first. Then length equals length of value times two, else, else length just equals the length of value. Um, you know, because if it's not a wide character, then each character is only one byte. So, you know, it's not really too much there. Um, and in reality, you could use either one of these. Um, if this, you know, is something you would prefer, you could always change this line to this. Um, but if you're used to seeing this kind of thing, it's really not that complicated. The main thing to keep in mind is like this is kind of seen as one statement because of the and. So what it'll do, and because this actually does return something, you know, a number, that returns as true. You know, it evaluates as true in a sense. 
So that way, you know, all this together evaluates the true, but this ends up being the first return, so that's what will actually set length if wide character is also set to true. Um, whereas if it's not, then we go with, you know, it, it determines or, and then we'll just use this. Um, and, and a lot of languages have ways of doing this. Um, it's been way too long, but I swear like C sharp, it's, um, I want to say you would use a question mark here and a colon, or it might be colon and then question mark. Um, uh, not really, you know, you could just look up, uh, I'm not even sure how you would find that. A uh, single line if statement, well, I don't know. Um, we're not going to worry about C-sharp. <laughs> you know, there, there's other tutorials that are probably way better suited. Um, watching a video tutorial or a Lua tutorial to learn about C-sharp just doesn't make sense. So let's not to go that route. Um, anyway, so either one of these, you know, either one of these will work fine. If this makes more sense, you use this. Um, you know, because you, you want your code readable to you. That That is very important. You need to be able to read the code and know what's going on. Um, this is just something I'm used to doing in other languages, and I like this better just because it's one quick line, and I can kind of just know, okay, based on whether, you know, wide character is true, I'm either going to set it to the twice the length of value, or I'm going to set it to the length of value. And then here, you know, a, a little different, but we're still just kind of using that target self to determine whether we need to use local or the regular. Um, here we can't just do return because we need to do those right bytes at the end, so we actually create a status value. Um, and then here we just determine whether, you know, if this write wasn't successful, then we don't need to write those bytes at the end, and we're just going to tell you at the end that it wasn't successful. Um, if it was successful, then whether or not you set um, no zero terminate to true or false, you know, so if it's false, we want this to evaluate to true. That's why we use the not. Um, so that way we can know to go ahead and write that null character at the end. And then we return our status when that's all done. Um, and then, you know, kind of same thing down here, just the local string, you know, local write string and local or not local, regular write string and regular write bytes, and you know, not too crazy there. Um, but again, the important thing here is I do add that functionality of automatically making it a null terminated string. Because um, I just, I don't understand why it does, doesn't do that by default, but that's just something it does. And I guess there are scenarios where you just want to set part of a string and that does give you that functionality um, to where you can do that. And even I have a uh, a write string ZT is what I called it. Um, I believe it is down here at the bottom somewhere. And now... Uh, So even I've got these functions that I've written, and I could use those directly in there. Um, I chose to not have to import the functions file for the objects for, for some reason, but um, but you can kind of see here we're, we're doing a real, you know, basically the exact same thing, uh, although I'm not returning a status. I may fix that later. Anyway, um, so, you know, I mean, you could do that a lot of different ways. You could have more of this, you know, outside of here and just, import your uh, functions and then just call that function here much like we do in the rest of them. Um, that's entirely up to you. And then because there is that wide string type, um, again it's really mostly for the auto guess and the um, data structures um, in the dissect data structure tool. Uh, there might be a couple other tools that use it but uh, that, that's how it's documented. Um, but I decided to go ahead and use that so that way you wouldn't even have to set that wide character uh, either argument or the uh, property for the instance. You could just call this directly. But in the end, all that does is we're just going to call our read string function here, pass it to max length, and then we're explicitly telling it that it is in fact a wide string. Um, same thing down here, just with the right. You know, we, we pass it the value, we pass it the no zero terminate, and then we, you know, tell it that it is in fact a wide string. Um, and that's kind of it for the 
the memory object because of course we've already covered the uh <laughs> sorry i'm stretching um we've already covered the you know read custom and write custom not doing anything quite literally um and then these again while they're kind of complicated all we're doing is just concatenating the type name with the word read so that way we can read d word or read q word or whatever based on the instances type um and that's that's kind of it um so not too crazy and complicated but again like we've seen in uh, second to the last video that gives us you know the ability to use you know a memory object um and not only you know throw it in a table and use get address so that way we could have underlying structures and you know all these memory records that you can manually set and change and do whatever um manually set and change the values of those addresses um, but they can use these underlying objects and allow us to not have to you know type in the base address that we're, we've hooked or something like that and again if it changes you know it, it makes changing that much easier um, and then again with this memory object we can actually directly read and write using it and just make it simpler so that way it's you know instead of having to have our whatever string or address we're using for say health again we can just you know create a, a health memory object set that address one time and then health you know colon read or you know health colon write and whatever value and and all that kind of stuff um yeah we yeah we're kind of going over it i guess uh let's go ahead and print the um the object itself just a basic one um, to kind of look at that table structure one more time here Big old sausage fingers. <laughs> okay, uh, print that out. And then we can kind of see here, now we've got a little bit more in this table. Um, so much so I can't even display it all. Um, but again, that's where we kind of see in our meta tables where all those functions we've got exist. Um, and then we still got in the, you know, in its meta table, the meta table of its meta table. But anyway, down the, down the line of the inheritance, that's where we actually get our register symbol and get address and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's, you know, obviously if you do understand inheritance really well, then, you know, this is just kind of redundant. But, um, but if you don't, hopefully this kind of helps illustrate how you know what's going on here um, and, and how this stuff kind of works that way we can actually you know we've still got access to any one of these functions and it will still work in much the same way so you know if we're calling our our get address here it is in fact a function and you know it, it, it just allows us to keep building these structures up and not have to repeat ourselves and all of that because we don't want to do that um i don't want to do that and then you know the next one we'll kind of get into um just because this one i know is getting long we're going to do it in a separate video but there we might be able to cover a couple of things because you can see here the next one it inherits from memory so we can you know get address set address stuff like that uh, get address um but then we can read and write from it but then here it'll be allocated memory so we could actually allocate it first um, and then start using it as whatever we need to do um, it just kind of depends what we need um, and then on down the line so um yeah i believe that's it for this one and on to the next um there will be code snippets for that memory class um, again i will probably you know start with commenting that one out um you can put it back though so that way you can 
add this to your defines file and you don't have to have it in here and you can use it all over the place if, if you're so inclined. Um, if you don't feel like you ever will then technically you could actually delete it because literally the only place I'm thinking I'm using it is setting the default in this one class. Yeah. Yeah, so you really don't need it. The only place it actually gets used here is this. Um, and of course, you know, I, I'm making sure you kind of get the idea that again, that these two are equal. VTD word is equal to this. So um, that just kind of depends upon how you want to go with it. Um, for some reason, I like the idea of having a memory types table with, you know, all my memory types in it. Um, more honestly for iterating through it at some point if I need to for some reason. Um, don't do that, but and even I'll admit I, I get lazy and I tend to use VTD or just because I, I remember those. You know, I don't need to worry about typing all this out. I can just write VTD words. So you know, whichever form you prefer, go with that. Um, I just I like giving myself options at certain points. As much as I like being explicit and lazy, um, explicit or lazy, I guess would be a better way to say it. Uh, I do like having options. Um, having more options is just, you know, it, it just makes things more interesting. Again, that's, you know, part of the reason for the aliases and all that. Um, so whatever you want to do with that is up to you. Again, like these, you could actually change to be the match the function names if you prefer that. And you would still need to set an alias for this stuff down here to work, um, read and write. But you know, again, that's kind of entirely up to you how you want to set that up. Okay, so this is actually the end, and we'll move on to the next one.